Welcome all to the Retirement Success in Maine podcast. My name is Ben Smith, and per usual, uh, my co-host is is here, the Cook's Lobster and Ale House to my Jordan Snack Bar, Curtis Wister. How are you doing today, Curtis? All right. I like the theme. I'm doing well, Ben. Doing well. You know, we're getting closer to warmer weather, so I might have to go to Jordan's here soon. Yes. And, um, and, you know, it's in Maine, when you start kind of seeing the temperature creeping up and it's thirties and forties, and we're starting to get into the fifties, you start dreaming of summer a little bit. So, so we gotta, we gotta bring out a little, uh, little lobster and, uh, clam rolls going on. Exactly. So, but, um, we are really excited about our show today and, and, uh, and some of this from our client's perspective, right, is, again, we, we're listening to when people are sitting down with us, not only their goals and their aspirations of what they're looking forward to in retirement, but also their fears, right, is sure. there's things that they're scared about. And, you know, this topic has come up a little bit, has been the, the concept of, of Alzheimer's. So mm-hmm. we wanted to dig in a little bit about that today. And currently, more than 29 thousand people in Maine are living with Alzheimer's disease. And we've had an episode on caregiving. There's also 46,000 caregivers and they're providing 68 million, million hours in unpaid wow. care, right? Wow. So they're doing it because they love that person and they want to take care of them. And so dementia caregivers are providing 20% more care today than they did in 2009, right? Mm. So this is a bigger call, a bigger challenge, and it also kills more people than breast cancer and prostate cancer combined. Wow. And if you kind of look through, so Alzheimer's and dementia deaths have increased by 16% during the COVID-19 pandemic. And I know there's there's lots of challenges around um, uh, getting care and caregiving and, uh, and assisted living and nursing facilities. So that, that was the big challenge, which I think is we're obviously seeing some ramifications of today. Mm. And some of our longtime listeners of, of our show might remember we had an awesome conversation way back in episode eight. And I know we, when we say way back, we're, we're in our sixties now. <laughs> so right. you go way back to eight with uh, Dr. Cliff Singer of Northern Light Health at Katie Hospital. We had this conversation about breaking down normal cognitive decline mm-hmm. versus what is more serious. Mm-hmm. But we wanted to talk about Alzheimer's specifically. And, yeah. and then also what's happening um, in uh, with Alzheimer's in the state of Maine. So that that's kind of the premise of our show today. And again, I think that's it's just good to kind of go, hey, things have changed since we first had our uh, kind of our, our last conversation with Cliff Singer. Mm-hmm. And, and that was, I think, the, the call for let's try to find our expert in the state of Maine that can help us out with that. For sure. And, you know, we, we reached out and, and our next guest um, we're super excited about. She uh, serves as the program manager for the main chapter of the Alzheimer's Association. Um, the Alzheimer's Association leads the way to end Alzheimer's and all other dementia by accelerating global research, uh, driving risk education and early detection and maximizing quality care and support. Our guest holds a master's degree in organizational dynamics from the University of Pennsylvania and a Bachelor of Social Work from Temple University. She has also held previous leadership roles with Philadelphia Philadelphia Corporation for Aging, Lehigh Valley Aging in Place Coalition, Catholic Charities, United Way, and Care Patrol. She is also a certified end-of-life doula, Reiki master, and a certified yoga instructor. So with that background, I would love to welcome Amy Angelo to the Retirement Success in Maine podcast. Amy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So Amy, well, we are, we have lots to talk about around the Alzheimer's Association and what, what you're seeing and, and, and especially within nationally in the state of Maine, but also we, we always want to get to know you a little bit, right. Is, um, hear a little bit about your story. So love for you to just kind of share with us to start a little bit about your childhood, where you grew up and kind of your career career path here because you you have touched on lots of different areas in your career it looks like hey yes I have however um, most of it has been in the older adult field um, you know first off I, I was born and raised in a small town in Pennsylvania um, I was an only child to parents who 
at the time had me, I guess, would be considered later in life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, maybe not so much so today. Um, I, uh, I was really close, you know, with my, with my maternal grandmother and I, I would deliver home deliver meals with my mom <laughs> growing up. I loved doing that. And yeah, so then fast forward, gosh, I went to college. I studied social work. Um, I did an internship at the Philadelphia Corporation for Aging. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's one of Pennsylvania's area agency on aging's. Um, I think I found my passion really there, uh, working with, with older adults and providing services to them and their support systems. Um, you know, then I went to work in a nursing and rehab center for a few years before mm -hmm. uh, going to work for the PACE program, which stands for Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly. And I was with two different PACE programs over 12 years doing marketing and business development. And um, really, that's just an amazing program that helps to keep older adults living in the community. Um, and then, uh, gosh, what did I do next? I went to work for the United Way um, in the Lehigh Valley area of Pennsylvania, first with their gatekeeper program, educating organizations and companies on how to recognize the needs of seniors. Um, and then I became the director of healthy aging and food access for them. And then my last position before joining the Alzheimer's Association was with um, one of the largest national senior care advisory companies as a business consultant. Awesome. Well, in, in Amy, it sounds like as well as, as you kind of said, there's a nice through thread that you have there relative to this aging population. So I will say it, from a gravitational pull, I could see why Maine had this pull for you just because of obviously we have, you know, one of the oldest states in the nation. We have a big need for, I think, help within the state of Maine around an aging. And I think, actually, I think that's where we got introduced to each other was through the Maine Council of Aging. So our, our organization joined and uh, got introduced to the, the Alzheimer's Association of uh, Maine chapter that way. So pretty cool uh, kind of connections is getting kind of joint passions together and finding ways to collaborate there. Yeah, it's been great. Um, Amy, I want to ask kind of, so what's been your personal experience with Alzheimer's and, you know, why are you so passionate about helping those afflicted by the disease or helping a loved one who has it? Sure. Okay. <laughs> well, gosh, going back to my childhood again, my first experience with Alzheimer's was when my grandmother was diagnosed with it. I think I was in about sixth grade. She was around 80 years old. Um, you know, I got to see the progression of the disease mm -hmm. and I saw how she became less and less able to do for herself. Um, you know, it was particularly noticeable because my grandma was uh, fiercely independent. <laughs> she eventually came to live with us, with me and my parents. And, you know, it really did become unsafe for her to live by herself. Um, and, yeah, I saw the, the toll that caregiving took on my mom and my parents um, and even affected, you know, me. It was kind of traumatizing to see um, the, de the decline and, um, you know, what everybody was going through. Um, I got to see, you know, my grandma become more and more confused and paranoid. Um, she would sneak out of the house and often we get called by our church parish because mm -hmm. the police would pick her up wow. and the only person person's name that she would remember was our priests um you know, she didn't know to to say our names or mm -hmm. she didn't know where she lived but she knew her priest and so the priest would be called and then he would call us and and that happened a number of times, even though we were in the house with her and, you know, we thought we were taking all the precautions and apparently not. Um, so it was really upsetting, you know, to witness this as a child. Um, and then later um, as an adult, then it became obvious that my father was exhibiting signs of dementia. Um, my mother was in, was in complete denial. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I now had like some experience around this, some professional experience. So I, I worked with her, um, tried to work with her to uh, get some services and make a plan. And then after my mom passed away, my father came to live with me. He moved in with me and I became the primary caregiver. Um, 
he eventually joined the PACE program, which is where I had worked. Mm -hmm. And that allowed me to still work full time. And it allowed him to stay at home, you know, as opposed to going into a nursing home. Um, And he would still get the care and all the socialization that he needed. So that was, that was great. But then um, as he was entering his, the late stage of the disease, he was diagnosed with bladder cancer and he passed Mm. away four months afterwards. So Mm. I have the the firsthand experience, both personally and professionally, of how the disease affects people, you know, um, for both the person and the diagnosis with the caregivers, it could be very stressful. It could be, you could feel very isolated, um, like you're going through it alone, you know? So, um, I just wish that our family had known about all the resources that the Alzheimer's Association provided for free, Mm -hmm. you know, um, at the time, because we would have educated ourselves more on the disease and we would have been able to lean on the experts and, um, you know, access a support group, you know, the educational programs and just really get that support that we needed. And, and Amy, I think that's that's um, that, that's really awesome. Thank you for sh- kind of sharing that because I know yeah. it's, it's obviously really difficult to to kind of go through that. And uh, I, I had a similar experience with my grandmother as well as kind of seeing that decline. And it was it was slow, then all of a sudden, very rapid um, decline, kind of all at once. And um, it just just kind of from the family perspective and trying to figure out who's taking care of her and how we're all filling in and. Uh, so, you know, when we talked about the caregiver role is, is what we want to talk about today, in addition to, hey, if, if that diagnosis is me, right, and, and, and here's what does this mean for me personally as, as we go through that, and in addition to, to what you just said is, look, here's resources out there. You are not alone. You have, you have organizations here to support you. You just need to raise your hand and say, Hey, I need help. Mm -hmm. And that's what we wanted to go into a lot today. So I want to ask you just directly about the Alzheimer's association. Can you talk about what you do personally in your role as a program manager, in addition to what services that, um, that the Alzheimer's association, the main chapter uh, provides? Sure. Um, Yeah, the Alzheimer's Association, the main chapter, is part of a network, right, of more than 70 um, chapters nationwide. And our vision, you know, is really just a world without Alzheimer's. So our goal Mm -hmm. is to end the disease, ultimately. Um, You know, we're the largest private funder of Alzheimer's research globally. And, um, you know, we provide care and support to families here um, in Maine and all over the country facing Alzheimer's. Uh, you know, we, we do this through our support groups, um, educational programming, our 24 seven helpline. Uh, we do annual conferences. <laughs> In fact, we just had a free family caregiver conference where we had over a thousand um, attendees in the New England region, which was wow. amazing. Yeah, there's a conference for professionals coming up, um, as well as a person-centered dementia care training for direct care providers. Um, Another large area of our work is advocacy to pass legislation Mm. that would help families facing Alzheimer's and other dementias. Um, And of course, you know, our fundraising, which makes the care and support and advocacy possible. Uh, We have the Hallmark Mm. event, the uh, Walk to End Alzheimer's. And we have another fundraiser uh, event coming up in June. June happens to be Alzheimer's and Brain Awareness Month. And so that event is based around the summer solstice and it's called The Longest Day. Mm. Um, Maine specifically, gosh, there are so many ways that we reach our constituents um, and people can interact with us. Um, We have people visit our website mostly for access to information on our up-to-date research and clinical trials. Um, You know, they could attend a fundraising event, uh, perhaps one of the seven walks that are in the state of Maine. Mm -hmm. Um, They could volunteer to become a support group facilitator. They could be a community educator. Um, We have community representatives and we have advocacy um, ambassadors as well. Um, But really, you know, we want people to know about our 24 seven helpline. Um, It's the entry point to all of our programs and services, um, especially for folks who don't have reliable internet access or Mm. have access to a computer. you know, and even if there's like translation services um, needed, they are available. 
and um, the TRS operator services as well. And, you know, we serve everybody, regardless of immigration or insurance status, and it's always free. So it's Amy, can, free. can I, can you just walk me through that, right? So here I am, um, you know, I either maybe myself or I'm caregiving for somebody that either I suspect is Alzheimer's or maybe just get recently diagnosed with Alzheimer's or another dementia. Mm -hmm. um, so I call the hotline, right? So I call the hotline and I'm, I'm talking to somebody at the main chapter or maybe a national uh, piece on the Alzheimer's association. So what, what is, what are, what do I get in return? Mm -hmm. So what am I like, why am I calling and what am I getting back? Sure. And, um, and what are they plugging me into and what, what can I receive either maybe from the initial contact or maybe, Hey, that's a year from now. And, you know, I, I have more questions or, or I'm, I'm in another stage or I don't know what I'm doing. So what, what, what does that conversation look like? And what, what are they getting in return if I call in? Sure. So anybody could call at any time during the day, you could call as many times as you need to, you could call weekly, <laughs> right? You could call year after year. You could call if you are looking for um, specific resources in your area, okay? That helpline number, our 24 seven helpline is answered by master's level clinicians. Mm -hmm. And they, are, they have access to the, all the areas where we have chapters and all of the resources in those areas. So if you are calling to look for a support group, if you are calling to register for a program, or maybe you're looking for a specialist in the area, um, respite care programs, area agency on aging, so they have all that information at their fingertips. They also, on the other side of this, have the ability to walk you through a situation. Um, if you yourself are experiencing a different or a difficult or challenging time, as a caregiver or as a person with the disease, you can call that number with whatever question it is that you have, which with whatever situation is presenting, and you could get that support and assistance and guidance. Nice. Great. Um, so Amy, I want to kind of keep going with our conversation here and really dive into the topic today, which is obviously yeah. Alzheimer's. Um, mm -hmm. So just kind of a foundational question, I guess. So obviously there's a bunch of uh, brain related illnesses out there. Um, we hear terms that just, we feel like the common lingo just kind of gets lumped into mental decline, right? So yeah. can you just kind of take a minute and help us understand Alzheimer's and its relationship with dementia versus, um, you know, what may happen with Parkinson's or Lewy body dementia, for example? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, it's a, it's a good question because that, that does happen. Um, but mm. dementia is the umbrella term for an individual's changes, um, really in their memory, their thinking, or their reasoning. Um, there are many possible causes though for dementia and Alzheimer's is the most common cause and it accounts for 60 to 80% of all cases of dementia. Okay. Um, Alzheimer's is hallmark though by the presence of tau tangles and beta amyloid plaques. And these are large accumulations of microscopic brain fragments <laughs> that slow a person's ability to think and remember. Sure. Um, but you may have heard of like other causes of dementia such as vascular dementia, which is marked by changes of the blood flow and the blood vessels in the brain. Mm. Um, there's dementia with the Lewy bodies, which you had mentioned, which is identified by specific changes throughout the brain that include the buildup of a protein known as alpha synuclein and frontal temporal dementia, which is marked by brain cell loss in the front sections or the frontal lobes of the brain. So we encourage everyone who has any concerns about their brain health to be seen and evaluated though by a physician for an accurate diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Awesome. Well, so again, now that we kind of know maybe what uh, Alzheimer's and dementia is and also what it isn't. Um, so let's, let's talk about that because you kind of talked about all the different parts of the brain and, and that there's kind of different pieces there of, of kind of causes or, or, or things that are, there are signs of, of different types of dementia there. So what, what are some signs um, of dementia versus maybe what is typical age related changes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So, um, gosh, the signs are really, it, it's what, it's what changes, um, 
that in the changes that occur that interfere with your daily activities, right? It's, it's memory loss that interrupts your daily life, you know, versus forgetting a name or an, mm-hmm. an appointment or like remembering it a little later, right? For instance, um, gosh, you could have a daily route to the store, to your church or something that you've taken for years. And then suddenly one day you don't remember how to get there or you get mm-hmm. lost going there, right? That's a sign. Um, it could be challenges with planning or solving problems. So for example, that could be managing your finances, um, something that you, you used to be quite competent in, and now you cannot complete that task. Um, it could be confusion with time or place or season, you know, versus forgetting the date, you know, occasionally mm-hmm. we all do that. Mm-hmm. Um, it could even be difficulty in understanding visual images and spatial relationships, right? And versus cataracts, you know, mm-hmm. is there yeah. something physical, physical right. going on? Um, another is misplacing things, right? We all do that. Um, so like, say I come in the house, um, and I misplace my keys so I could retrace my steps. I could say, all right, I walked in, I went to the kitchen to get a glass of water. Ah, my keys must be in the kitchen mm-hmm. right? versus someone who can't do that. They can't go mm-hmm. back and remember that they went into the kitchen and got a glass of water and they still had their keys. Right. Right. Um, another big sign could be, which is kind of subtle, but you, you may recognize it, um, is changes in mood or personality. So like withdrawing from work or social situations. Um, this was, this was evident in my father. Um, clearly, you know, he was a very social person. He had a job that was around a lot of people, um, and he loved it. Right. But in the Mm -hmm. mid stage of his disease, he started to become agitated and he couldn't hold a conversation like he used to, which was really frustrating for him. And, and groups of people became just overwhelming. And so he withdrew. Mm. Which, which I'm sure just even in that case of here, he is a social person. That's what recharges him. That's what kind of energizes him in his life. And all of a sudden now he's behaving in a way that is causing people to go away from him or maybe not want to be around him because they, they don't maybe um, understand the emotional outbursts that might happen or they, they, they go, that's not him or he's being really mean to me or kind of yeah. being a jerk. So I don't want to be around someone that is mean to me all the time. And, and you can see where that uh, those sorts of things could create even more withdrawal. Yeah. Um, and, and then even cause more changes, right. As, as they're kind of trying to understand why is, why is this happening where people aren't as friendly with me as they used to be? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's, there's, there's the question of, you know, does social, social, social isolation cause more dementia, you know, but when you are experiencing those withdrawal symptoms, you do become more socially isolated. So it's a vicious cycle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I want to, I have kind of a, a scenario question, I guess. Um, so I want to, so let's say either I am seeing signs say in my spouse of, of Alzheimer's um, or say my spouse sees signs in me of Alzheimer's. So I want to ask you kind of what's the best way to start a conversation with our loved ones about mm-hmm. seeing these concerns? Yeah, gosh. Well, first, first recognize that it's, always never easy mm-hmm. <laughs> for either party to have this conversation, yeah. excuse me, conversation. Um, you know, we've heard from many that some of the most difficult conversations that they've had to have with their loved one um, is, you know, going to the doctor to get a diagnosis from our medical, medical yeah. care around the disease, right? Yeah. Deciding when it's time to stop driving. <laughs> that one is very difficult. Um, yeah. And then yeah. making, making plans for managing finances um, and legal documents, just to be sure that the person's um, wishes are carried out and that the costs of care are covered. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so the, just these, right, are obvious, obviously very important things that you want to address. Um, we have educational programs also that offer a variety of approaches on how to have these conversations. Yeah. Uh, a lot of times people want to wait for, you know, the, the right time to have the conversation, but rarely is there a perfect time. Absolutely. You know, we definitely want you to have the conversation sooner than later to assure that that person with the disease has a voice in their planning for their care. Mm-hmm. Um, 
you know, so we recommend before jumping into it <laughs> to develop a plan on how to finesse the conversation. Um, you want to ask them maybe would they want to know if if you've noticed any changes in their functioning? Um, in most cases, they'll say yes, in which case that gives you then the mm -hmm. opportunity to and permission to have the conversation with them. Sure. Um, if they say no, <laughs> which could happen, but you want to focus then on the, um, you know, the, the challenges and the fears that might come up around that, like maybe why they wouldn't want to. And then of course, you know, you might want to have a conversation a little later, yeah. but talk about why it's so important to, to have a conversation openly, yeah. um, you know, prepare yourself, take notes, know what you're mm -hmm. going to say, use I statements, avoid blame, um, yeah. You know, consider their feelings. You know, sometimes there's triggering words like the word are Alzheimer's that you mm. you don't want to mm -hmm. you might want to steer away from. Sure. You know, and just practice what you're going to say, and then yeah. <laughs> no, I, I like that. Those are all th that was all very helpful. And then, so I'm going to keep going now with my my hypothetical scenario here. So let's pretend I've had this conversation with my spouse, or they've had it with me. Um, kind of that next step, how do we go about actually getting a diagnosis for these illnesses, right? Yeah. So maybe that conversation didn't go well. And I, I don't want to go to a doctor, like, I'm fine. <laughs> Trust me. I'm so like, I feel like those conversations happen. So, so what would yeah. you say to those people who, I guess, just how can we go about getting that diagnosis? Yeah. Well, if you've had the conversation and they're not interested in it, you're not interested in going to the doctor. Um, you know, you could maybe let them know that it's, you know, first let the doctor know, my elder sure. doctor, your mm -hmm. concerns, right? And then, and then maybe let them know that it's time for their wellness exam <laughs> at okay. the doctor. And then maybe try and pair that with a, with a fun outing, you know, make it, oh, we're just going to go to get your wellness exam done because the time, the time is mm -hmm. now. Like um, yeah, like <laughs> if they like still don't want to go to the doctor, right? We call it like, um, we call it, you could do like a therapeutic fib okay. and, um, <laughs> and tell them that like, you know, invoking an, an outside authority sometimes is helpful, right? So yeah. you could, you could say that the insurance company uh, requires it for prescription refills or like a policy renewal or something. So that's like, that honestly though. Yeah. No, yeah I, I, I might be using therapeutic fibs in my future. I'm yeah. Say. That's yeah. a good one. Yeah. 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 Okay. Especially with my, my second grader. This, <laughs> well, I'm sorry. It's a therapeutic <laughs> fib, you know? It, absolutely. We all know them. Um, <laughs> but really, you know, if it's still not working, I don't know. We would, we would encourage you to call the helpline mm -hmm. um, <laughs> because it, of specific advice, right, is is different for every sure. every family. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they could also locate a specialist in your area. Yeah. And, and to your point, Amy, I think also is what you're saying is also like trying to maybe the um, you know, you kind of hear the 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 sandwich there of like, well, let's put uh, let's put some good news in the front of it, or let's do something fun in front of it. Like we're gonna go to breakfast. And then, right. which, cause you love going to breakfast. And then we have a small little quick wellness check at the doctor. And then <laughs> we got the, you know, the other thing you like to do is then go to lunch and then we got a lunch planned and that's, those are the, yeah. so at least it's a fun day. One right. little minor thing, you know, I that sort of stuff. I do it all the time with my father. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yep. But you know, ultimately though, it's important to get that, that early diagnosis if you yeah. can, you yeah. know, to roll out the other factors. Cause if you're seeing signs, it could be mild cognitive an impairment for some reason um, that might not progress to dementia. It could, you could be seeing signs of cognitive decline or confusion for another reason. It could be something physical like an infection, right? Yep. So crucial to be evaluated by medical professionals. And, and then Amy, I know we'll talk about it at the end of the show, but um, obviously in, then in terms of, well, then you get your diagnosis and then uh, of whatever that might be. And then being able to say, well, hey, whatever we are, the earlier we, we can address it, then the earlier we can provide, you know, some level of medication that may either help, help slow it. Um, you know, all those things to kind of together are important. So we'll talk about that in, in a little bit, but I want to, I want to flip over to, okay, well, Obviously, we talked about people in Maine, there's 29,000 people in Maine living with Alzheimer's is a disease, and there's a lot of caregivers, right? 46,000 caregivers providing 68 million hours, right? That's, I don't, I don't even know what the math is per yeah. day on that. That's, that seems like it, it's incredible. So 
so if I'm a caregiver here, so let's talk about, all right, let's talk about the caregivers out in the audience and what are some things that they would want to know about understanding and responding to dementia related behaviors. And I wanna keep going here with not only just that, but what's the best way to now arm myself with knowledge of good tactics or tactics maybe that I wanna steer away from when helping a loved one with a diagnosis? Yeah, that's funny, the the wording that you use, because we have, um, I mentioned educational programs, our free educational programs. most are being offered virtually right now. Um, and I think that they are invaluable to caregivers. Um, what we have one specifically called understanding and responding to dementia related behaviors, mm-hmm. because there is such a need. Um, you know, this disease is not well understood by, you know, people not in the field. And often it's, you know, just, it's your dad, it's your spouse. And you can't understand why they're now doing X, Y, or Z, right? Mm. So we, we have these programs and encourage everybody to take them. Um, but I think the most important thing to understand about the disease is that there are, there are actual physiological changes happening in the brain. Um, so that if someone's exhibiting difficult behaviors, it's happening because of the disease, right? It's not because the person is trying to be difficult or to challenge you their behavior is because of how the disease is affecting their brain. Mm-hmm. Right? So having that understanding is the first thing. Um, and, you know, we have a program called Understanding Alzheimer's and Dementia. Um, we have effective communication strategies, right? These are, all, these are all the programs that I wish my family had taken, <laughs> had known about and taken. Um, for care, for caregivers who may be experiencing the challenging time, like I talked about earlier, the, call the helpline. If you're just at a loss, um, they could help, they could help, they could direct you to resources, education programs, information as you need. Um, and I encourage caregivers absolutely to join a support group. Mm-hmm. Um, there's multiple groups now happening, um, both in person and uh, virtually. We're, the Alzheimer's Association is back to in person as of April. So mm-hmm. we're excited about that. Yeah. Um, There's such a great way to meet other people and to develop a social network of support around you. Um, we have uh, Q&A sessions. We have live recorded sessions with Q&A. We have the pre-recorded sessions. There's just so much information on our website. You could download uh, publications on all topics um, from finding an in-home care provider to making an end-of-life decision to caregiver stress. Mm-hmm. Um, all of that information is on our website under publications. Uh, I would encourage you to look into a respite program, right? There's res- see what respite programs are in your area. This could be an adult day center. Uh, there's volunteer companion programs. Even residential assisted livings offer may offer um, the occasional respite stay. Hmm. Um, well, and I, I know that obviously from a, from a caregiving perspective, and I know what you just said, Amy, is we, I think we, the, the big underline we want to take today is it feels like the feedback we get is that, um, that the, the folks that are caregiving to, to the loved one, it feels they're siloed. They feel alone. They feel not trained, right? They like, I, I was a, you know, I'm good at cooking or I'm good at, um, I'm, I, I was a program manager. I was a banker. I was, uh, you know, I was in retail my whole life. I've never been trained yeah. how to help a loved one with a diagnosis and take care of them 24 seven. That's not something that I know how to, so i I think all the things that you just said is not just from a, even just communication, but also what does it mean to be a caregiver in those support groups? We talked all the way back in episode two with Diane Walsh at the Eastern Area Agency on Aging. Um, And I know she's, we have a new executive director there uh, now as well, but that's something we're talking about, hey, support groups and saying, hey, I'm, 
I'm just starting this role and I don't know what I'm doing mm-hmm. yeah. and having other people there's like, oh, I was there and this is what I went through. Yeah. And these are things that I went to do. And these are local things that I, I found was very useful. Or I talked to those people and they, they weren't as useful. All of those things I think are really helpful to go. You're not alone. You are, you know, you can find support either just from you as a caregiver of, I feel guilty. I feel like if I go to the movies and take a two hour break, that I feel like I'm letting my loved one down because I'm taking two hours for myself. Mm -hmm. All of those feelings and all those kind of things that we're all battling with as caregivers, I, I see all the value is, is just probably way more than ever. You, I know it's all free, but you know, that you could ever even charge just because of what you're giving, getting back yeah. from the caregiving perspective. So I want to, I want to ask just another question though, on, on the other side is what if I can't be a caregiver directly myself, mm-hmm. right? I have maybe other responsibilities. Maybe I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, and my dad is in Bangor, Maine, yeah. and I need to have someone take care of him, but it's only me. I'm the only person, the family member in his life that would, would help, but I can't be there for whatever reason. Yeah. What what sort of things could someone do to kind of find support for someone that they love if they couldn't do that role personally? Yeah. Um, the first point of entry usually always is to contact the local area agency on aging. There are okay. five here in Maine. They're all over the country. Um, there are some that cover specific counties or more than one county at once, but um, you could go to your Department of Health website and or department of um uh, health and human services oh older it's different in every okay. state but yeah it could it could be health and human services it could be department of aging um mm-hmm. but check out those websites and locate your local area agency on aging they have lists of resources um they could mail you information they have programs which you might be eligible for um there's um, many of them have wait lists, but many of them do not. Um, they could direct you to uh, different respite programs, different daycare centers, um, you know, even in-home care agencies, because that's an option as well. I know like, you know, labor with the pandemic has been a little difficult. However, yeah, there, mm-hmm. there are a lot of agencies that have maintained their caring staff and are doing a lot to keep, you know, to keep them. And, um, you know, because they really, they understand the value that, that they provide um, to, to caregivers. Um, so a lot of those in-home care agencies can offer flexible hours, can give you respite. Um, if you are out of state, can be the person to, you know, care for your loved one in the home, unless it becomes unsafe. Um, and in which case then there are um, assisted living facilities, uh, boarding homes and, and nursing facilities that are here for that reason. Um, but more for more specific resources in your area, you know, you could always call our helpline as well. They know. That's great. Um, so I want to kind of flip the script a little bit. So I know we're, we just spent a lot of time talking about caregivers um, and caregiving. So I want to go back to being the, uh, the individual with an Alzheimer's diagnosis. Mm-hmm. Um, just what is that like mean for me? What is my future of living with that disease? If you could kind of talk about maybe the early, mid, and then late stages of living with Alzheimer's. Sure. Well, first, I just want to say that there could be a stigma, right, with the disease. Sure. Um, so we really want people to understand that life is not over after you receive a diagnosis. Uh, you could still live a full and meaningful life, you know, with some adjusted expectations. Um, it's very important in the beginning, once when you first get the diagnosis, to, to start to build that support team around you. You know, your friends, your family, your neighbors, your physicians. Um, you know, connect with the local Alzheimer's Association. Arm yourself with those resources right mm-hmm. up front. Um, start taking the educational programs. Join a support group for early stage. Um, you know, start to connect with those who, like like you said, have been through it, um, who are going through it. In many areas, we have early stage social engagement programs that you could get involved in. Um, but like in the beginning, yeah, 
stay active, um, you know, continue to eat healthy, make sure that there's a plan in place. Um, you know, you might have trouble, you know, in early stages, you know, finding the right word or, you know, forgetting things from time to time or forgetting how to get from place to place. Um, you know, faces become, you know, unfamiliar at times or they can't replace a face with a name. Mid stages, you start to withdraw a little bit, more agitation, things become a lot more difficult. Um, mm. And in late stages, you need more care. Usually you can't be left alone and you do need um, the supervision and support of those around you. Um, you know, we, we just advise staying healthy, um, you know, active, eating healthy, yeah. um, getting the plan in place that addresses your financial, emotional, yeah. <laughs> social, physical needs, right? Yeah. Um, and use the resources and support available to you to stay positive. You know, the most, the more planning you do up front, the better you are. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, uh, I think those are really awesome tips, especially for early, mid and late there. Yeah. Um, and you kind of raised up um, a point that I want to ask about mm -hmm. is because uh, you kind of hear the myths a little bit, right? And you, you hear myths and lots of different things like, you know, you can't sit, um, you know, again, I'm talking my, my 10 year old, you can't sit two feet away from the television, otherwise you're going to go blind. <laughs> you can't do that. So, you know, things that we hear in terms of myths, and one thing from this end is, we hear a lot of I need to keep busy. And if mm -hmm. I don't keep busy with hobbies, work, social, if I stop, and I just sit and watch TV today, or uh, and I hang out, I'm just going to develop Alzheimer's and I'm just going to um, um, kind of wither away. Mm -hmm. So true or false? I know you said a little bit of it. So I want to see about like, what, what would you respond to that statement? Well, so we know a few things. <laughs> yeah. We know I hope so. sitting <laughs> around doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get Alzheimer's, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, you might need to sit around. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. <laughs> right? sure. You might need to take a rest. Um, we do know that Alzheimer's though is not a normal part of aging. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we know that living a full and active lifestyle though is known to reduce risk. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean it absolutely will, right? And doesn't mean if you yeah. do sit around, it's it's just not it's going to definitely happen to you, right? Yeah. Um I would say not to put too much um, into the myths that you hear, but really, you know, do what you know is good for you. <laughs> mm -hmm. right? good. Um, if you feel you need to sit around and rest, then maybe that's what your body needs, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if you feel like you're being lazy and your mind isn't being active, then get up and go do something engaging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I like, I like that a lot. Um, and I think you just kind of touched on this, but my next question is, so what are some things, um, you know, that we can do all of us today, um, to kind of prevent or to help prevent developing Alzheimer's mm. down the road? Mm. Lots of studies, lots of studies done. Um, we funded <laughs> several studies, which focused on lifestyle, right. Which mm -hmm. is awesome. Um, there was one called the U S pointer study, and that's based on a successful study out of Finland around diet and lifestyle. Um, so you can read about that on our website. Uh, we advise absolutely love your brain, <laughs> right? Cause we know that, um, what's good for your heart is good for your brain, right? We have a brochure, 10 ways to love your brain. Mm -hmm. Some of which are get plenty of sleep. Mm -hmm. Um, keep learning and challenging yourself, right? We know, um, so what's good for your heart is like the DASH diet, the Mediterranean diet, hmm. um, exercise, yeah. you know, break a sweat every day, uh, don't smoke. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, just uh, stay active and, and be healthy, hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Uh, and, and so, Amy, I, I guess want to ask about so today, right? And and we talked about also from 2009 to now that we're seeing more kind of caregiving happening, and it seems like there's kind of some 
and and again from anecdotally as financial planners, right? We are looking at that people are looking to live longer, that they are doing some of the things that you're saying, right? The message is getting through, and we're as a society, hopefully, maybe there's there's things we are doing a little bit better. Um, you know, maybe there's things we aren't doing better, but maybe there's things we are, and that's leading to uh, us to live longer lives, and and perhaps living longer lives might lead to maybe some more brain health issues o- uh, over time as well. So, what do you see coming in the horizon here? From not only just kind of where we are in the in kind of the, the mental um, health perspective and, and dementia and Alzheimer's, like where are we? Are we getting worse? Are we getting better? But also what are, what are you seeing new advances happening right now around treatment? Because I think those two things kind of go hand in hand. Yeah, it's a, it's a super exciting time right now in research around this. Um, mm-hmm. You know, as you may, you may know, there are plenty of drugs that have treated the symptoms of dementia and Alzheimer's, mm-hmm. right? Um, they've been around for quite some time, you know, however, the first drug to address the underlying pathology of the disease was approved by the FDA this past June called Agilhelm. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a bit contentious though, because the CMS decision <clears throat> um, limits coverage of it, you know, but, but it's a beginning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's not perfect. It's a beginning. And there are also drugs, other drugs that are in clinical trials right now. Um, they're called the monoclonal amyloid bonding drugs. Mm. They are, um, they're in the pipeline and they're showing promise for future treatments. So very exciting stuff. And because there's so much going on, um, it's continually development, developing and changing. Um, we host a research page on our alls.org website uh, with loads of information related to uh, the research that we fund and the current clinical trials. So I would advise just to um, check that out and you could read all about the um, the current research, um, everything that's being done um, in the, in the field right now. And, and Amy, just kind of tying it together, because I think you kind of said this um, in your intro about the Alzheimer's Association in the main chapter, right? It is obviously doing the fundraising and doing all the work. Now I just kind of helping the resource for, for people that are um, afflicted with it today in the caregivers that are supporting uh, that population, but also is the funding of that is, is going to these res- this research. It's going to the advancements. Yeah. It's going to that future yeah. and that mission statement that you shared about, hey, we're, we're dreaming of the day when we've ended yeah. uh, Alzheimer's and, and dementia related illnesses. So um, kind of it's, I, I just always like to bring the two together of, hey, we're doing all this for a reason. And yeah. also, is it working? And to go, hey, in June, we just had a really great um, uh, treatment that's, that's now becoming available and becoming a, um, a, a start to how we can start addressing some of this, not just from the symptom perspective, but the root cause and, yeah. and help going. That's really exciting, I think, from a, hey, we've, we were starting to see momentum and build and not just, yes, we got research and we, we continue to pay for more research and we're not seeing kind of this over the hump thing. So that's really exciting. I think for the entire community there, that that, uh, congratulations to, uh, to the entire group. Thank you. Yes. I'm more hopeful now than I've ever been. (laughs) Mm. Great. Um, So we've kind of reached the end of our conversation, Amy, I do have one last question for you. Um, (laughs) So obviously, the name of our show is retirement success in Maine podcast. So we love to ask all of our guests, regardless of what we talk about for the first bulk of the show, how are you going to find your personal retirement success when you get there? Gosh, I hope I'm prepared, (laughs) right? Um, I think being, you know, being prepared helps anyone be successful in anything that they want to do, right? So I put a lot of value in planning. Um, I want to hopefully live as with as little stress as possible when I get Mm -hmm. to retirement age. So I'd like to be as financially savvy now as possible, right? Um, I, because I don't know what the future will hold, sure. you know, for my healthcare, yeah. I want to assure that I have adequate savings so that, um, my end of life care can be planned and, and paid for, yeah. um, financially and, um, in every way, you know, mm-hmm. I have yeah. wishes, 
um, clearly stated. Um, and certainly I want to live my life now to the fullest within my means. And I want to live a purpose-driven life filled with exercise and great healthy food and meditation and lifelong learning and all the things that we know are good for your brain. Awesome. Fantastic. Well, Amy, we, we really can't thank you enough for coming on our show and sharing with us about the Alzheimer's Association, uh, your personal journey, um, and your personal passion for, uh, what gets you up in the day. You, you really, um, you're really a great ambassador, um, in lots of different ways to, for the community and also for, um, everything that, uh, the Alzheimer's Association, I think really stands for. So thank you so much for sharing it. And, um, we really can't, uh, thank you enough for coming on and we'll hope to catch you next time. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's been wonderful. All right. Take That's care. You do. So yeah, I think Amy Angelo did an awesome job today, really walking us through um, even just from the Alzheimer's, what it is, dementia, um, what resources are out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about the Alzheimer's Association going through? What if I'm diagnosed? What if somebody I love or I am taking care of is diagnosed? All of those things I think are really pertinent questions that I think um, our population really has a lot of questions on. And that hopefully you out there um, also yeah. maybe got something out of all those points. Yeah. So as we always like to wrap up our shows, we always like to take that yellow highlighter, underline something of, of something we personally took away from today's show. So Curtis, what was, uh, what was the lesson you took away from our conversation with Amy? Yeah. Um, you know, I think to be short, it was, uh, use the resources that are out there. Right. I think this whole conversation, everything just cycled back to, you know, how many great resources are out there for regardless of the stage, whether it's you, that's, you know, you worry that you're showing signs of developing Alzheimer's, your spouse, your, you know, your caregiving, there's resources for caregivers, there's educational, like there's just so much out there and it's, free i mean not like we mm-hmm. were talking about in the show it's it's probably worth a lot more than being free but it's free out there use it mm-hmm. um you know amy talked about she wished she said it a few times she wished that her family had the resources or used resources like this as both her grandmother and her father kind of lived through this so i just i think to not to not hone in on something specific, but I think just the whole conversation of just how important and how useful these resources are to use, I think is just a, a big takeaway for me. Yeah. And, and I know we, in, in our show, right, this has been a theme for us is we we've kind of dabbled in this lots of different ways. And one was, uh, you know, we talked about Dr. Cliff Singer from Norlight uh, Acadia yeah. hospital. And, and so we talked about from the medical uh, yeah. perspective right and and I think where we wanted to go with with Amy was a little bit more of the all right the resources I'm in it perspective and what does it mean this actual diagnosis and mm-hmm. what does it look like and and that and and I know in episode 44 we talked to Iris Whitecler right about yeah. hey I'm a caregiver and what does it mean to balance taking care of somebody else but I also have my own life to live exactly. and I want to do some things in my life and just because somebody else gets sick doesn't mean that I need to stop progressing in what I am and who I want to be and what I yeah. want to do exactly. so all I think all these are are kind of a nice little bridge and a nice little theme about um, kind of a companions to each other about surrounding this conversation, this fear that we get with our clients. So I thought mm-hmm. again, Amy did a, did an awesome job with it yeah. and, and kind of going through all that, especially with some, there's, is there's a bright, there's a, there's a sunrise on the horizon, I think around treatment and advances oh, yeah. that are happening, which is, which is really awesome. So we are at episode 62. 62. So we are, I, th- right. I think, I think we're officially eligible for social security now, right? That's right. We're, we're That's right. I don't know if we're going to claim quite so, yet, but we're there. We're yeah. You, that not, yeah. You know, we, we got to do that analysis, see whether right. we should be claiming at 62 or full retirement age or 70. Exactly. But, um, so for those that want to dig in a little bit more to the Alzheimer's Association, you can go to our website, blog.guidancepointllc.com backslash 62 or for 62 uh, the episode um, you can check out the resources there and uh, again our transcription will be there as well for if there's anything you want to kind of zoom in on yeah. um, feel free but um, we really appreciate your listenership 
Um, it, it, we're just very privileged and we're very grateful to have you on our, um, on our journey with us and kind of st and staying in tune with us. So all the best to you. Hope you have a great day today and we'll catch you next time.